thank you to all of you for coming. And in particular, as Emma says, it's nice to see so many people here from the Brewery History Society. And I should probably begin with a slight apology uh, to the Brewery History people um, that there aren't really going to be that many brewers uh, in this talk. Um, the book that I'm just completing at the moment has two intertwined themes. Um, on the one hand, how brewers uh, make their ideas about brewing credible to chemists, and on the other hand, how chemists make their ideas credible to brewers. Because in the period I'm talking about, those are really two rather different worlds. So in this talk, I'm going to be focusing probably more on the chemists. Although, if you want to ask about the, the brewery side, uh, I'm very happy to take questions uh, afterwards. So, um, I should probably start out uh, by explaining my title. As I say, um, the world of the brew house and the world of chemistry, theoretical chemistry, very different worlds in the 18th century. Uh, people with chemical expertise were very often, they had medical backgrounds, or they had, for instance, industrial uh, chemical backgrounds. They were compounders or wholesalers of chemical commodities. They were not brewers, by and large. And brewers, typically, were not chemists. So... Anybody who wanted to make chemical claims about brew house practicalities had a bit of a barrier to overcome. And we can see this in the published literature. In, for instance, this is an anonymous work of 1765, The Complete Maltster and Brewer. So it's a practicing malt maker and brewer outlining his theory of the business. And he says, you've got to watch out, everybody, because there are people who write about brewing... Okay? And they know about writing. They like writing. They don't know anything about breweries. Okay? They don't have the practical experience which you need in order to be able to describe brewery processes. So what do they do? They speculate. They carp about practices which they don't really understand uh, the purpose behind. And they eventually they sell their books for money. So the brewer loses by buying them and loses again when he attempts to put their theories into practice and finds that they are useless. And those chemists who were trying to communicate with brewers noticed this, and again, it comes through in the published literature. So, second little excerpt there. That is from Humphrey Jackson, who I think some of you will have heard of. Humphrey Jackson is uh, an operative chemist, a wholesale chemist, uh, based uh, on Tower Hill uh, in London, who gets interested in the brewing trade via his work on... Isinglass. The brewers here will know exactly what isinglass is. It's a substance prepared from the sounds of the sturgeon and various other fish at uh, various different times, which is used for what's called fining beer. Okay? So the beer is brewed, it's cloudy, you add this substance to it, isinglass, and it floats through the beer and it clears it. Okay? It makes it beautifully clear and sparkly. And in case you're wondering, the beer typically doesn't smell of fish afterwards. Although that is a concern which will come up a bit later in the talk. Okay, so Humphrey Jackson finds out or works out the process for preparing Isinglass, which is quite an important piece of um, economic natural philosophy at the time, because that had been an enclosed process. Okay, all the Isinglass had been imported um, from Russia uh, via, via the Dutch. And nobody in, uh, in the British world knew how to perform this process. So Humphrey Jackson publishes on how to make isinglass. Okay? He actually gets a publication into the philosophical transactions uh, on that account. But he also publishes uh, this private work, an essay on British isinglass. And he says, OK, I've got the isinglass method. I can be of general benefit to the brewers. I can tell them all sorts of things about the brewing process. But when I try to do this... People carp at me. And he's thinking here of people like the author of The Complete Maltster and Brewer, whom he <coughs> cites. And he says, their objection is, how should a chemist understand brewing who never saw the side of a copper? A copper, OK, that's the boiling vessel in which the, uh, the work, the unfermented beer, is boiled with the hops. And the question is, you haven't got your hands dirty, OK? Until you've been by the side of the copper, until you've supervised brewing, how can you possibly understand brewing, Right? So the argument is, chemists by their nature understand chemistry. By their experience, they know how to do compounding of pharmaceuticals and that kind of thing. They don't know brewing. So Humphrey Jackson makes explicit that there is this objection against his work, 
so that he can then find a way of dealing with it. And this is his response. And if you've seen similar kinds of work, you won't be particularly surprised by this. Um, he says, what you have to realise is that the art of brewing must be acknowledged a chemical process throughout. OK? Now, all right, hundreds and thousands of people all over the country, many of them illiterate, are at this moment brewing. But they're not brewing well. On the basis of chemical knowledge, you can learn how to improve the process. So Jackson's claim is, yes, you can learn how to brew about as well as the people who brewed before you, just by traditional practice. But brewers don't know how to experiment, and they don't know how to analyse. OK? I have this method, in common with my fellow chemists, which involves resolving the components of brewing, so the malt, the hops, the yeast, and so forth, into simple parts, separating those fittest for our purpose, rejecting the rest. So he's talking about optimising making the highest quality beer, or the strongest beer, or whatever it may be, uh, and reforming the practice. And he says, look at the materials of brewing. Look at yeast. What is yeast? How does it perform this mysterious fermentation process so that the substances you apply it to become less sweet and become alcoholic and start to give off fixed air, carbon dioxide, as we would say? This is a deeply obscure topic, and it needs serious chemical investigation. And he says it needs to be brought up to the level of medical knowledge, pharmaceutical knowledge. And the only people who can do this, he says, are chemists. Now, that might look like quite a strong case, but it's problematic. Nobody is automatically authoritative in this period. Okay? Everybody who presents a treatise for money and says... OK, I will deal with you, so um, I will sell you this knowledge. Brewers are fairly savvy people, OK? They're used to weighing up the quality of what's vended in the open market, and they're used to people trying to diddle them, OK? So when a chemist comes along, they're as suspicious of him as they are of anybody else. And they would look at his background, and they would find out, for instance, about the methods that he used to try to protect the income from his knowledge. So 1762, a little bit before the Isinglass publication, we find Humphrey Jackson circulating this pamphlet. He's proposing to set himself up as a public lecturer on brewing, okay? or rather a semi-public lecturer. You might know about public lecturers from this period, people like Peter Shaw, uh, William Lewis, uh, Benjamin Martin... Uh, Humphrey Jackson takes the same kind of uh, approach. He uh, offers his lectures by subscription. Okay? So when I've got 20 subscribers, then I will start giving my lectures. Okay? But he says, this is different. This is not conventional sort of mathematical, natural, philosophical, and chemical knowledge. This is something that's for the trade. It's commercially very valuable. You don't want me selling it to your neighbour as well as you. So for that reason... I'm giving you the opportunity to get in on the ground floor. And look at the way that he does this. He arranges to print his lectures, which Peter Shaw had done, which most lecturers uh, tried to do. It was a good way of getting additional income from them. But he's going to print them with gaps, blank spaces, to put the most important information. And if you're one of his privileged subscribers, you go along to his lectures, bless you, with the book, and you fill in the blanks. OK? OK. So, this is a mercantile position. It's knowledge for sale. And it attracts some criticism, in particular from other people who are trying to sell knowledge. And these, of course, include brewers. Jackson has a particular rival in uh, the form of a man by the name of John Richardson, uh, who some of you will have heard of, uh, if you know your brewery history, as the inventor of a device called the saccharometer, okay, which was an adapted um, hydrometer used for measuring the sugar content of worts, from which you can work out information about the strength of beer. That work comes in the 1780s. In the 1770s, uh, Richardson is operating as... I think he was a brewer. I... I've seen nothing to suggest that he was anything other than a conventionally trained apprentice brewer, although his background is quite obscure, his early background. By the mid-1770s, he set up this parallel career for himself as an instructor for brewers. And 
The first uh, visible sign that we get of this is this entirely anonymous publication, Observations on the Art of Brewing, in a series of strictures on a secret system, published in 1775. Now, this is uh, it's a really extraordinary, really fun piece of work. What it is, it's a parody of Humphrey Jackson. So Richardson sees Jackson's appeals to the brewers, okay, and uh, on his own account, uh, he is taken in by them, so he goes along to Jackson's lectures, he pays Jackson uh, quite a deal of money, he is entirely disappointed, and he is left with the standard brewer's objection. objection. Jackson is a chemist, chemists don't know brewing as well as I know it myself. So he comes up with this ferociously sarcastic pamphlet about everything that's wrong with chemical brewers like Jackson. And this, uh, the text that I put up here, uh, it makes no sense unless you use the appropriate tone of voice for it. So he says, the brewer founds his success merely on confirmed experience. The chemist, on profound analysis and dogmatical hypothesis, with his chemical key, he unlocks every door of the principle of brewing. He can walk at large in a kernel of malt like Shakespeare's Queen Mab, sail over the surface of a boiling wort like the Nautilus on a hop leaf, and securely visit every corner of a fermenting must in an air bubble. So he's setting up Jackson as this sort of great quack vendor of ridiculously optimistic solutions. He describes him as grand master of the secret society of brewers. And continuing in the, in the kind of the sarcastic register, uh, he explains the problem with old women, okay, unlettered people, is that they're merely convinced by being able to brew properly. Okay? That's all they're bothered about. A philosopher will ignore the question of whether the beer is any good or not and concentrate on whether it works in theory. Okay? Now, this is a very familiar satirical trope. Uh, you can see there the reference to Dean Swift. That's Jonathan Swift, author of Gulliver's Travels. Those of you who know the third book of Gulliver's Travels, that's the one with the account of the Academy of Legado. Right? based on uh, some of the, uh, the activities of institutions uh, such as the one uh, we're in today. And the theory that um, adepts of natural philosophical processes were, in fact, ridiculous dilettantes who were merely wasting their time. So the particular reference is to the orgerous philosopher, which uh, some of you will probably remember is the, uh, the man who is shut up in his little laboratory trying to analyse excrement back into food. Okay, as a useful contribution um, to, uh, to human knowledge. Okay, so uh, Richardson's point is that Jackson is exactly like that. He's ignoring practicality, ignoring, ignoring common sense, and producing pointless footling analyses. And he gives the example of a ridiculously abstruse theoretical brewer uh, who sticks his fingers into the boiling wort, okay, the unfermented beer, and refuses to believe that they're hot until he's demonstrated theoretically that there is heat in them. Okay? Stepping away from the sarcasm, Richardson then goes on and explains what he finds is wrong with chemical consultants like Jackson. He says, the problem with chemists is that they work in their laboratories, which is all very well for things like pharmaceutical production, but it's not a brew house. Okay? Chemists deal with proof glasses, with tiny little containers where they can easily analyse things, okay, where, where they can do their controlled experiments. The real brew house is not like that. It's a big, noisy, dirty space, which I understand, and he doesn't. And then there's the standard objection to the chemist, that a person who has scarce seen the inside of three malt houses in his life should be able to give you all the different processes of all the different malt houses in Europe which Jackson had apparently claimed to do, is really surprising. And then there's a little dig at Jackson's use of language. Jackson used very, very high-flown philosophical terms, like enchiaresis, okay, which you will not find in most dictionaries. It basically means manipulation um, or, uh, or process of chemical alteration. Uh, so he says, It is perhaps more than probable that he never attended the enchiaresis of one malt house unless he has a portable one of his own in a mahogany case. That's the problem with chemists, okay, according to Richardson. <coughs> they are mahogany case people. They don't understand the discipline of the brewery. And you will see the ultimate consequence of this and various other factors, uh, 
uh, which some of you will know about, mm -hmm. is that Jackson's reputation is very, very badly dented. And specifically, he ends up uh, with a, a posthumous reputation, not merely as a quack, but as a poisoner. So this quotation here, uh, this is from uh, the 1809 abridged collected edition of the Philosophical Transactions. And it says, Mr. Jackson kept chemist shop. Um, Jackson, I should explain, Jackson was elected to a fellowship of the Royal Society in 1772. Okay, so he's one of the fellows. He published on Isinglass, as I say, in the, uh, in the Philosophical Transactions. But this, this little note is very, very damning about him. It says, Jackson fell on the scheme of brewing porter, okay, which is the standard beer of the London area, um, by certain drugs substituted as materials instead of molten hops. With these, he set up as a general instructor of the brewers by giving private lessons in the art at an enormous premium. Okay? And the result of this is a general complaint that the ancient national malt liquor is miserably degenerated. Okay? So he's ruined the natural beverage of the country. Now, the philosophical transactions abridged isn't even a biographical work. There is usually no particular comment on the authors of the papers presented in it. This note, this footnote, appears because the editors feel they've got to reproduce uh, Jackson's Isinglass paper because it was published in the PT, <coughs> but they want to make the point, this is shortly after Jackson's death, Jackson, OK, he blagged his way into the Royal Society, but he's not one of us, OK? We are disowning him. So why did this kind of thing happen? Well, I'd like to suggest that it's because the concept of drugging of beer was a very, very emotive one, OK? And the concept of a chemist in association with beer almost automatically leads to associations with the drug shop in the minds of most drinkers, OK? So without a chemical background, OK? There are many situations, even today, where you would think chemical authority would be a good thing, OK? Everybody here who has to take uh, drugs, medicines, if you are told that uh, there are chemists, there are trained chemists involved in the production process, you're generally happy with that, OK? Those of you who are not brewers, who don't have brewery backgrounds, if you're told that you're drinking chemical beer, you won't be happy. And bear in mind, if we step a little bit forward into the early 19th century... Okay, so about the time that this was, uh, this was produced, um, you will see there was an awful lot of public controversy about the behaviour of brewers, supposedly applying all manner of dangerous drugs to beer in place of malt and hops. Okay, malt and hops were very highly taxed, so some very exotic drugs would work out cheaper for them because they could dodge the tax. And this was a political issue partly because there were so many brewers in Parliament. Brewing was one of the most respectable ways to get a fortune together, if you didn't already have one. A lot of people with political ambitions were in the brewery. So you get images like this. This is quite famous. This is a Gilray cartoon of 1806, and it's about a policy enacted by the fairly newly arrived government of the day, the Ministry of All the Talents, which was a kind of a coalition government. Coalition governments, as you know, are notoriously unstable and tend not to last very long. So this, this one, you've got the government is the three people on the horse on the right-hand side of the issue. They're all riding one horse, which is kind of difficult because they don't really get on very well, as I say, it's a coalition. Um, so you've got, uh, in the middle there, is the Chancellor of the Exchequer uh, in this government, Henry Petty. And Henry Petty is trying to get through Parliament a really, really unpopular proposal to put a tax on home brewing. And Gilray is rather mockingly saying, what's going on here is he's helping out his cronies in the brewery. OK, so there are three brewers um, parading behind the horse. OK, they are left to right, George Barclay, OK, um, Harvey Coombe, and Samuel Whitbread, Samuel Whitbread II. Uh, the first Sam Whitbread is the one who got the fortune together. His son, Sam Whitbread II, is the man who spent it. Okay? And these three are all prominent radical Whigs. They represent between them three of the top uh, four breweries by output in London, at a time when London was um, the biggest uh, brewing city in this country. And you will notice they are carrying through the streets a barrel of quassia, now, Quassia is one of the best known of the supposed 
adulterant substances. Uh, it's prepared from a South American bark, uh, it's very bitter, and it was widely used as a substitute for hops, and a relatively untaxed substitute for hops. So the claim of this cartoon is that um, Petty is deliberately driving through this plan to tax home brewing, legitimate brewing, so you can see the hot poles in the background uh, being sold for firewood, because nobody's interested in them anymore, because the big brewers, who are driving the home brewers um, out of their activity, um, they don't really use tax commodities. They are dodging the tax by adulterating, by using quassia, Instead, And also other substances. You'll see that um, I've got a little blown up bit there at the bottom, uh, bottom left. Thank you. Um, Barclay uh, has in his pocket a book of receipts, recipes, to make a cauliflower head. This is a, recipe, uh, this is a reference to a substance called heading, which was usually prepared from alum and salt of steel, uh, ferrous sulfate. Uh, and it was designed to throw a kind of a frothy head on the beer. And there were, there were pamphlets in circulation which told you how to do all of these things. Okay? And uh, the consequences of this you can see radiating from the pot there. Debility, colic, uh, dropsy, scurvy, uh, various idiotism. Okay? So the theory is this is a poisonous practice, and the brewers should not be consorting with the druggists. It's political corruption that makes them do so. And worse was to come uh, the following year when this little paragraph appeared uh, in the Morning Post and several of the other uh, main London papers. Nobody knows where it came from, uh, but its effect was fairly deadly. It claims that Porter was not merely adulterated with, but mainly compounded of opium, tobacco, um, deadly nightshade, um, and various other narcotic poisons. Okay? Now, this wasn't true. A substance called Coculus Indicus, which is fifth on the list, was widely used uh, in beer, uh, to judge from prosecutions. So was number six, Nux Vomica, Strychnos, as in strychnine, uh, both of which were bitter substances uh, which were applied to the beer, supposedly, to, to, add, to add bitterness to replace hops and to give some, some kind of a more intoxicating effect. The other substances, for the most part, that's probably pure invention. Okay? But who was to say whether that was true or not at the time? And if you're looking at that little paragraph which appeared on the, uh, on the back page of the Morning Post on the 23rd of January, and you're thinking, well, that's a tiny little paragraph. Who would have noticed it? Okay? Uh, in fact, an awful lot of people noticed it. And this found its way into all sorts of representations, like this cartoon of uh, later in that year. This is Isaac Cruikshank. Um, the modern porter brewer, uh, sorry, the porter brewer and his family, or the modern druggist. So you can see there, the porter brewer is introducing into his, uh, his fermenting vat a demon brood. Okay, these little babies have horns on them, right? So uh, the one that he's just uh, giving his, uh, his left hand to there, that's deadly nightshade. Okay, tobacco is also about to go in. Nux vomica, coculus indicus, that's the blue one, and so forth. Come along, my little boys, uh, says the brewer. That's my darlings. Meanwhile, in the background, uh, on the right-hand side, you can see uh, two little babies uh, who don't have horns. They're quite angelic little creatures. They are molten hops. And they're saying, Father, don't take any notice of us now. He has got so many bastards. <laughs> rather, rather imprudently, uh, the brewer is conducting this operation in full view of an open window through which is looking John Bull, the personification of England. And John Bull, who's a kind of a, a down-to-earth type, says, Odd Zookers. What? Be I to take all those fellows in my guts? Why? I shall ne'er want any more physic. Physic, of course, meaning medicine. So the idea is the identity of the brewer has been completely replaced by that of the druggist, and that's very bad news. And just to show you a slightly later cartoon, this became conventional enough. Here's another Gilray. That, um, this is, again, uh, the man who's toppling here is Sam Whitbread II, who's, uh, along with various his, of his fellow radicals, his schemes have been upset by the people who Gilray is rather fonder of uh, in Parliament. And you will see that he's, he's dropped there his barrel of mischief and his essay upon political brewing without malt or hops. And among the various substances which are spewing from the barrel of mischief are quassia, coculus indicus, and opium. So... That's the case against the intervention of chemists in brewing. Now, 
In terms of public reputation, were all chemists seen as being a bad thing? No, they weren't. In this period, early 19th century, some chemists, as you all surely know, were seen as being a very, very good thing in the sense of their value to the national economy and in terms of their moral probity. There were successful, fashionable chemical lecturers in, for instance, this city, men like, for instance, Humphrey Davy. Now, I want to show you uh, side by side two quotations from the shorthand transcript of a trial that took place in 1809 of a brewing firm, Brown and Parry, that's the Golden Lane Company, some of you will know this case, um, who were indicted for using an Isinglass substitute. Okay? And the Crown's case, or rather the, it's officially it's the Attorney General's case, is that they had been applying putrid fish to beer. Okay? Uh, it's quite complicated. Officially, even Isinglass is illegal, if you look at the letter of the law. Isinglass had traditionally been permitted because it was a, an established substance. Any substitute for Isinglass automatically raises the charge that you're, you're putting putrid fish in beer, and we don't like that. And the Solicitor General gives this wonderful little speech, which uh, it's very, very repetitious and rambling. I've cut it down an awful lot here, but you can see there there are several repetitions. Putrid fish may be said to be an admirable refiner of beer. Very likely it may, but what then? I do not choose to have my beer fined with putridity. Keep your stinking fish to yourselves. You must not put it into the beer. And he goes on and on and on like that. And then counsel for the defence calmly start calling chemical experts. First of all, uh, they call William Murdoch, who is, uh, who is the patentee and the promoter of uh, the process for an Isinglass substitute. And he explains the process. And after that, they put Humphrey Davy on the stand. Davy is, he's not yet Sir Humphrey Davy, he's not yet the grand old man of chemistry, but he is one of London's most popular and well-connected lecturers. And he stands up and he confirms Murdoch's evidence and he uses nice sort of public friendly uh, language and says, oh no, it's fine, there's nothing wholesome in it. Our jellies are made with Isinglass. It's exactly the same substance as Isinglass. It's chemically indistinguishable. What's, what's the problem? And uh, after Davy's given his evidence, uh, the defence brief says, uh, my lord, we have another chemist. And the judge says, after Mr. Davy, you need not trouble yourself. And he, uh, of course, sums up uh, for the defence. So, there are multiple kinds of chemical reputation in play at this period. But not everyone who was a public uh, chemist or who was a well-connected chemist was necessarily as safe in that sense as Davy. And somebody else who I think will be known to some of you is uh, Frederick Ackham. Okay? who in the 1810s was a very, very pub uh, popular public lecturer associated with the Surrey Institution, uh, associated with the Royal Institution and uh, various other um, lecturing haunts uh, around London, and also the publisher of some very popular chemical literature. He was well-connected. He had patrons, including the Duke of Northumberland, and his, probably his real smash hit was his treatise on adulterations, of 1820. It flew through four editions and a German version uh, and an American edition uh, in the space of a couple of years. Okay? Uh, there, it was a real public spectacle because he really, well, what he claimed to be doing was dishing the dirt on really nefarious, really nasty, really uncomfortable adulterative practices in beer, in bread, in wine, uh, in pepper, in all sorts of other substances. Uh, this book has a cover which is unusual for the period. Usually, you know, you order a book and you get the pages and you get them bound. This book came with a specific cover design, uh, with a grisly motif of a spider devouring a fly in the centre of a big web, and this biblical quotation, there is death in the pot, and there's more of the same in the frontispiece, okay, with a skull and serpents and all the rest of it. Major smash hit, uh, but uh, it actually, uh, it reproduces an awful lot of information that was already in the public domain. Okay, so Ackham goes through the register of convictions uh, for adulteration of beer, much of which is in the parliamentary papers, and he says, um, small brewers are routinely adulterating. They're using all manner of poisonous substances. But he's very, very careful about not antagonising anyone powerful. So he says, the biggest brewers in London, okay, they don't do any of that. They are men of very high reputability. So your Whitbreads and your Barclays and those people, okay, they're fine. Now, 
This approach obviously doesn't go down well with the small brewers. So Ackham has got people gunning for him. And he's also got a little bit of a reputational difficulty. He doesn't, he's very, he, he is more concerned about uh, achieving that big popular effect than he is about being scrupulous in his handling of evidence. And he has described an awful lot of adulterative processes. Now, he says the point of chemistry is that it can rescue you from adulteration. But a lot of his opponents say to him, no, what you've done is you've produced an adulterator's handbook, whether deliberately or not. And you'd see, for instance, this is a cartoon of 1827 from a comic poetry anthology with illustrations that's, that shows the Grim Reaper in a variety of different situations. So this is the Grim Reaper as a dealer in um, materials for beer and other commodities. Okay? And you'll see their nice little puns on, called ale from the hundreds that ale with them here, and beer from the numbers they bring to their beer. Now, Death, in the, uh, in the cartoon, he's got a picture of Ackham's list pinned up on his wall for ease of reference. Thank you. So uh, the idea is um, anybody who wants to adulterate, who wants to cheat and poison uh, the, uh, the good old British consumer, has only to inquire within the pages of Ackham's book. And this is the argument that is raised by John Tuck, who is a small brewer who has set himself up as a brewer's consultant. Uh, this, the second edition of his book uh, comes out not long after Ackham's uh, treatise and after another book by Ackham, which, in which Ackham tries to pr provide a guide to the brewing process. And Tuck's argument is that Ackham is not only irresponsible in spreading nasty little libels about the small brewers, he is also completely ignorant of, of brewing. And why wouldn't he be? You are a chemist, right? Everybody knows who Ackham is. Everybody knows the rough details of his career. Everybody knows he's got no brewing heritage at all. So you're a well-known chemist. You go to a brewer and you say, could you tell me all the details of your process? Now, the assumption among brewers is that the same brewer would say, no, of course I can't. That's my livelihood. Bugger off. Or a sane and sneaky brewer would tell Ackham a pack of complete lies. And so Tuck goes through Ackham's treaties and finds information which he considers to be completely ridiculous and says, there you go, uh, this is a convincing proof how readily persons may be led astray by a reliance on science instead of practical acquirement. Okay? Science is fine, but if you want to do the science of brewing, it must be coupled to brew house knowledge. And then he says, I would ask, who learned brewers the use of drugs? The answer must be chemists. Brewers were tempted and have since completely discovered the fallacy of the experiment. And now the game is up. One of their own body comes forward to expose the evils they have brought on the brewery. So it's the typical con man making you pay again. You pay once to learn poisonous practices and you pay again to learn how to avoid them. So a chemical reputation was not necessarily a safe thing to have. So... How do we get from there to a position later in the 19th century when the validity of chemical authority was taken more or less to granted? Well, there are various uh, factors that weigh in the mixture. One I'm not really going to be talking about, but there were several chemists, okay, elite chemists with very often university positions, who noticed that this was going on and said, right, rhetorically, we need some answer to this. One of them was... Thomas Thompson, um, who some of you will know of, of Edinburgh and later on uh, Glasgow, uh, who actually performed experiments in a brew house. Okay? He was one of a three-man uh, three committee, uh, consisting of himself and two professors from the University of Edinburgh, who around 1806, at the bidding of the Scottish Excise Office, were sent into a brewery to perform experiments on the relative uh, value of English and Scottish barley and malt, in real life, albeit quite small, industrial quantities. Out of that experience, Thompson writes the Treatise on Brewing, which appears in the 1824 supplement to the Encyclopaedia Britannica. So it's one of the most widely circulated uh, pieces of information about brewing in print at that time. And Thompson is able to say very clearly, any concerns you might have on that score don't apply to me because I really was at the copper side. I was in a brew house. Secondly, 
There are brewers who uh, work increasingly with chemists. One of them is uh, another Scottish brewer. Uh, he's from Aberdeen. He ends up in London uh, in the 1830s. Again, more as a brewery consultant uh, than a brewer on his own account. And William Black is friendly with people in the scientific establishment who are concerned with the spread of useful knowledge. So uh, George Birkbeck, for instance, who's the, one of the key founders of the, the Mechanics Institute's movement, and then Thomas Graham of UCL. And this is William Black's take on the drug question. Okay? He says, you can't just assume that all drugs are bad. Okay? Clearly, much drugging is bad. But a chemical expert is somebody who knows when to drug and when not to drug. And sometimes you've got to. And he uses a medical analogy, which is a very good move, okay? because everybody understands the legitimacy of chemical intervention in medical circles. So he says, when everything is going on well, no drug is necessary. But when your beer is sickly, a chemical remedy must be applied. And it's only then that a brewer has it in his power to show his skill by using proper remedies. And in fact, he says, brewers have got to have chemical knowledge. They've got to know about toxins, because what if you accidentally convert um, some of the sugar in your brew into oxalic acid? Okay? Structurally, in chemical terms, they're quite similar. Okay? So you've got to know about these things. You've got to watch out. Secondly, uh, the attitudes to... Um, adulteration um, began to change. So literature like uh, Frederick Ackham's continued to be produced in the 1830s. So here's an imitation published probably uh, in 1830 called Deadly Adulteration and Slow Poisoning Unmasked or Disease and Death in the Pot and the Bottle. Okay, there's no picture of a skull here, but it's, it's fairly easy to see that uh, in which the blood empoisoning and life-destroying adulterations are blah, 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 are laid open to the public. Okay, this is, uh, this is presented in, in very similar terms to, to Ackham's. Okay, so it's a, it's a deliberately shocking expose. But look what The Lancet makes of it. The Lancet is very sceptical now of this, uh, this, this mode of writing. It says, uh, the word adulteration is not necessarily synonymous with injury to health. That is to say, you can use other substances and you might be cheating the consumer, but you're certainly not poisoning them. Okay, so um, we can fancy the valetudinarian peruser of a treatise like the present gasping in ignorant horror at the story of his porter being adulterated with quassia. Quassia is a medicine, okay? It is prescribed by doctors in far larger quantities uh, than, than a brewer would ever use. Okay, so it's, it's a harmless substance, free from any noxious quality. Okay? If, right, if writers on this subject separated the noxious from the harmless and dealt not so much in hyperbolical declamation, there would at the same time be less terror created and the ends of public justice would be more effectually attained. And of course, all the brewers who write, like William Black, who I just mentioned, like uh, David Booth, uh, also a trained brewer who produced a treatise for the Society uh, for the Diffusion of Useful Knowledge in 1829, they all make this same argument, okay? These substances are not necessarily toxic. They're not unnatural. Okay? Chemical intervention in beer is sometimes necessary okay? and very often useful. Gives the consumer a good product at a lower price. And so, eventually, by the middle of the 19th century, you get material like this. This is an advertisement that was very widely circulated uh, in scientific and medical journals and in, other, in, in more general journals in 1852 and 1853 uh, as a move by the brewers of Burton-on-Trent, okay, which was then establishing itself as one of the brewing centres of the world. Okay, London's been eclipsed by this period. Um, and uh, they were suffering from a story that had got about, promoted by, uh, by a French chemist, that they routinely used large quantities of strychnine. Okay? So what is their approach? They appeal to chemical authority. Okay? So uh, they have a list of testimonials from various chemical and medical sources. So, for instance, Thomas Graham of UCL, who I mentioned uh, a short while ago, uh, is on this list. So is, uh, so is Hoffman, uh, also of UCL, who was one of the pupils of uh, Justus Liebig, who is probably the chemist of his day. This is the period when 
Um, well, it's actually, it was, from, it's, it was really from the 1830s that uh, British chemists had said, we've got to reorganise chemistry, we've got to make it more organic, we've got to make it more in line with the things that Liebig is doing in Germany. Okay, so his laboratory system, his carefully schooled interchangeable research students. Okay, so they apply for a testimonial from Liebig. And what does Liebig say? He says, the specimens of your pale ale sent to me have afforded me another opportunity of confirming its valuable qualities. I am myself an admirer of the beverage, and my own experience enables me to recommend it in accordance of the most eminent English physicians as a very agreeable and efficient tonic, and the general beverage, both for the invalid and the robust. So, Burton Ale, according to Liebig, is practically a medicine. Now, Liebig supplied testimonials for all manner of substances for the usual fee. And reading between the lines, it is by no means evident that he'd even drunk the stuff. But the point that I want to make is about reputations. By the 1850s, if you want to head off charges that you are poisoning your beer, you call in a chemist. Okay? And the following years, across the, uh, the second half of the 19th century, saw an increasing uh, tolerance of chemical substances and chemical processes in beer. So sugar, for instance, had been, uh, had been permitted, or rather re-permitted in beer in, uh, in 1847. And this, uh, this included, or came to include, sugars and sugary substances made by more and more uh, obviously artificial chemical mechanisms. So sugar prepared from, uh, from, uh, from wood materials, from cellulose, uh, using a process uh, involving sulfuric acid. Uh, and in 1880, um, something that many of the more scientific brewers have been pressing for uh, happened, the so-called Free Mashton Act, in which most of the restrictions were taken off and uh, the law became, so long as you don't poison the consumer, you can use in your beer pretty much any substance you like. And that kind of resolves, or arguably resolves the question, right up until the great arsenic in beer epidemic of Manchester and Salford at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, that is another story for another day. The tensions about the naturalness of putting chemical materials into beer continued, and yet the validity of chemical expertise or chemical knowledge was, by the end of the period that I'm talking about, very firmly secured. So, thank you very much. Thank you.